Good morning or good afternoon everyone, depending on where you are joining us from, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Garrett from Business Review and I will be your host. It is our pleasure to have ILC Dover with us today who will be presenting this webinar titled CMO slash CDMO Facilities Gain Value with Single Use Containment. Our guest speaker today is Scott Patterson, Vice President of Commercial Sales at ILC Dover. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar platform on 24. You'll notice that this webinar is browser-based, so if you do disconnect, please just click on the link that you received via email to rejoin the session. If you would like to ask any questions for your post-webinar Q&A, please use the questions tab at the top left-hand corner of your screen. If you require any technical help during the webinar, please use the yellow help guide at the bottom of your screen for any assistance. For now, though, please allow me to welcome Scott. Uh, thank you, Jared. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we've got a dynamic group of attendees today that are coming in from all over the world, so thank you all for, for taking the time to join this webinar. I hope everyone uh, has good takeaways from the information that we're going to present. Uh, today, supporting myself will be uh, Stephanie Arthurs from our marketing department in our headquarters office, along with Wayne Fern from our technical sales department. So as Jared said, our webinar today will focus on CDMO, CDMO facilities and how to gain value while using single-use containment. The program is uh, including a definition of uh, flexible containment, which uh, will refer to both single-use and flexible containment as the same products. Uh, we'll look at a case study in an oral solid dosage process, including some data of uh, containment performance taken during an assessment. A uh, big change in the regulatory landscape for shared facilities such as CDMOs with changes in the health-based exposure limits uh, and uh, the ADE requirements now as part of the regulatory environment. Uh, we'll take a look at uh, really the true benefits that CDMOs can, can realize in using flexible containment single-use products. And again, as stated, uh, there'll be time at the end for uh, reviewing any questions. So please, if you have questions, uh, you know, send those through, uh, type those in and send those through and we'll take time to address those. So what is flexible containment? Uh, putting a definition to flexible containment, it's the application of single-use products to contain or transfer drug substances and drug products in the manufacturing processes. But we don't want to confuse single-use with a product that is not robust. Uh, we develop these products so that they can be used for a batch or a campaign or in some cases, even longer. And the key to this is when cleaning will have to be done. The value proposition of using flexible containment is not cleaning it, saving the cost and the time from cleaning and being able to dispose of it. So it's, it's, it's a very robust product, not to be confused with uh, use it one time and dispose because it's, it's not that robust. Uh, this is not a new technology. Beginning in 1997, uh, Eli Lilly saw the cost of containment of HPAPI compounds rising rapidly, and they sought out ILC Dover to develop technology uh, that could control those costs, and that's where flexible containment in pharmaceutical processing started. So this is not a new technology, and for the past 22 years has been applied to hundreds and hundreds of applications throughout the industry. So uh, looking at uh, visually, what is flexible containment? So, so we classify this in essentially two groupings. On the left is uh, to contain a process, which usually is an isolator type of containment. So you see examples of flexible isolators being used. And on the right, we talk about transfer. So we transfer products. We contain the process as it's being discharged and then charged into another process. So during that transfer, we maintain the containment. So two fundamental buckets that we use, either we're containing the process, which we will use a term contain at the source, which is a practice, or we're transferring the product while maintaining that containment. Um, so let's dive right into a case study for an oral solid dosage process. Uh, this, is, uh, we're, this is the part where we'll show data, performance data. So a little bit, a little bit of background of the, uh, the case study. Uh, the project was to retrofit with flexible containment to existing systems in a pilot plant that processed uh, that was an oral solid dosage process. Uh, the flexible containment systems were designed, and you'll see pictures of that for each unit operation. Again, we use the contain part of it, 
with flexible isolators and the transfer part of it, and we'll, we'll look at that transfer process. So the containment assessment was completed uh, following the SMEPAC protocol. So this is the standard industry protocol for understanding what the containment performance can be of a particular system. And in this case, uh, the surrogate was used, uh, and, and that surrogate was naproxen sodium. Uh, also, this, uh, in this case study, we had a containment performance target of 125 nanograms per cubic meter. Um, the uh, uh, standard for accept uh, pass fail, if you will, uh, was used the EN 689 standard. Now, this was done before 2018, so you'll see in the data tables that the target was 25% of the containment performance target, or we needed to, to achieve containment of less than 31 nanograms per cubic meter. You know, a note here of the changing regulatory landscape again, uh, the EN 689 standard that's, that's always been a part of the containment assessment protocol uh, was changed in 2018. So where uh, this case study used 25% of the CPT, the new EN 689 uh, 2018 standard uh, requires that 10% of the CPT is calculated. So this is a much tighter standard. And this was in recognition of the fact that compounds are getting more potent. And when using a small sampling set, there still is risk uh, so that uh, the 25% was seen to be too conservative. And so the 10% was adopted as the new standard in 2018. So at this point, uh, we have a polling question. So I'm going to pass it back to Jared, and he's going to introduce a polling question to the audience. Thank you very much. So the first question we have is, have you had a containment assessment performed on a process, and based on the results, have you changed your PPE requirements? The answers are, never had a containment assessment performed, have completed a containment assessment and the result required to maintain slash increase PPE, had a containment assessment performed and the result allowed us to reduce PPE. We regularly monitor processes so that we can minimize PPE, which is a cost savings and ergonomic benefit to the operators. Scott, what results are you expecting? Um, we typically see in the industry that uh, most companies will perform a containment assessment on one or more processes and use that as a benchmark going forward. Each company has their own standards on how to treat PPE based on this. So it'll be interesting to see what the audience reports. Well, let's find out now. So we have never had a containment assessment performed at 88.9% and have completed a containment assessment and the results required to maintain increased PPE at 11.1%. What do you make of these findings? Interesting. Uh, it's interesting because as we look at the containment assessments, it, it has become a key part of the environmental health and safety departments for uh, pharma companies that we work with. But uh, that's why we asked the question is to, uh, to get the pulse of what the audience is, is doing currently. Wonderful. Please continue when you're ready. Okay, so uh, on to our case study. Um, so here we, uh, again, looking at the um, a few more details of the case study for the oral solid dosage process. So in this case, uh, the containment used static pressure flexible isolators. Uh, often they, these will be referred to as passive isolators. Uh, this was chosen because of the need for a very fast delivery, quick installation, and immediately start up the systems. In this case, the CDMO, uh, needed to begin processing HP APIs that they had contracted. And so we, we had a very tight time frame to work with. And, and so by going with uh, static pressure isolators, that uh, reduces the, uh, the time frame. Again, the core idea we are achieving here is contain at the source. This is a uh, best-in-class practice where we want to be able to contain where the product is being handled so that we can reduce the exposure to operators, and also reduce the exposure to the environment, which is going to be a key as we look forward to some of the, the, the real value proposition offered and, and the reduction in cleaning. Contain at the source is always a key. 
And by using flexible containment and being able to retrofit these existing systems, uh, we were able to maintain that, that concept. Uh, we always look at transfer points and connections as the most critical parts of the containment design. Again, when we're looking at a stainless steel box or a stainless steel bin, uh, same thing with a, uh, a flexible single-use uh, isolator or, or FIBC. Particles are not going to pass through that wall. Uh, the areas of risk are at the transfer points and connection points. So we're going to look at that, and we're going to look at the bag-in, bag-out technology that we designed into these systems. And bag-in, bag-out technology really provides a dual layer of containment. We'll take a look at that. And also that the product bag, the bag-out sleeve, uh, is clean to the outside, so it can be handled without cleaning, where uh, technology like a uh, rapid transfer port or a uh, pass box there needs to be some cleaning at some point before the product can actually be handled. So here's a rundown of, uh, of the unit operations that were done. So starting to the left, uh, there was a weigh, uh, weighing and dispense operation. In this case, uh, the customer understood that they would have to sieve some of the, uh, the drug substance. So again, uh, we're showing the operation where it was a little bit more intense than just weighing and dispensing, but actually a hand sieving operation. Again, in this operation, the uh, surrogate, the naproxen sodium, was at a 100% concentrate to mimic the drug substance. So we truly were acting like we were handling the, uh, the HP API. From there, um, we transferred that out through bag-out technology and then bag-in technology to the blender. You see the bin blender here, uh, where the, uh, the surrogate was added in full concentration. Uh, but then the excipients were also added under containment. Uh, so so we, we were able to keep everything contained at the source as close to uh, the connections as possible. So now for the first time, we're, we're mimicking the drug product with the, uh, the drug loading similar to what their products would be, uh, the surrogate being the API and then the excipients involved. After blending, we went on to roller compaction and granulation. So we're preparing uh, the 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 product at this point in powder form into a granulation to go into encapsulation. Interesting thing on the roller compaction, uh, along with a good containment design for having low exposure levels, we have to think about the actual process and roller compaction can be unique in the fact that we're taking a powder and we're agglomerating that, pushing it together and essentially pushing all of the air out. And we've seen in examples that uh, a positive pressure can come from that process. So uh, a little bit hard to see in the roller compaction picture, but in the top right, there's a large HEPA filter that allowed us to exhaust any buildup of pressure so that we kept uh, a, a, an atmospheric pressure inside the isolator and not build up a positive pressure. Lastly, there's an encapsulation process. As you can see, uh, we build the isolator frame around the system in a skeleton form to allow for the best ergonomics and for operators being able to perform their unit operations without interference of a superstructure. So uh, this was the process that uh, we looked at and, and uh, now we'll look at the performance through the containment assessment. This is a typical data table for a containment assessment. Uh, the number one thing to look at is uh, we did have uh, test run one, test run two, test run three. This is all part of the standard SMEPAC protocol. Um, as you look at this, uh, the, the numbers under the measured concentration in nanograms per cubic meter uh, show all less than numbers. And so in this case, as, as often is the case in a containment assessment, that we were below the level of detection. So in the samplers that were taken, and all of these were air samplings, including uh, the, the bottom two lines, which were operator breathing zone samplers, uh, we were below the level of detection. So that drives uh, this away from being a sampler where we're looking at the mass on the sampler that we have to take the level of quantification of the surrogate, and we have to calculate that out with the volume of air that passed through the sampler to be able to then have a calculated uh, microgram or nanogram per cubic meter. So here, uh, everything was, uh, was very good in this uh, weighing, dispensing, sieving operation. And on the right-hand side in our, our gold circle, you can see that uh, we calculated the geometric mean, which is also part of the uh, 
the, the, the SMEPAC analysis, and the result was very good. And you can see the bottom statement is the device passed. So everything was well below the 31 nanograms per cubic meter. And in this case, even applying the 10% EN 689 standard that exists now, we would have had a pass. Moving on to another data table. Um, so this is for the roller compactor. So here we start to see uh, some information where, where the samplers uh, did uh, find particulate. Um, and so uh, this goes to, again, each process can be a little bit different and each process and product has to be looked at. Uh, an interesting uh, aspect here is in the test run, uh, one, test, uh, test run number one, we uh, do have a reading at 34.2 nanograms per cubic meter, which is above the, uh, CP, uh, the, the EN689 CPT, as we keep referring to the 31 nanograms. But the uh, analysis, the statistical analysis, allows for readings to be above the 25% in this case as long as it's not above the containment performance target, which in this case was 125 nanograms. But then we refer back to what we have in the gold circle is we still have to have the geometric mean calculation that's going to be below the 25% of the target. And in this case, we, we had basically an outlier at the 30, uh, 34.2 nanograms. So the calculation for the geometric mean Allow, and, and the geometric mean allows uh, to have a 95% confidence in the performance of, of the device. And so as you can see, again, the bottom statement says pass. So the device passed. And here we have the, the final process in the OSD chain, the encapsulator. Um, and, and again, we see different numbers here, but we see the lowest numbers here. And so that goes to the effect of uh, that each containment system has to be looked at for what is the process, what are the product characteristics, and what is the quantity of product being processed during each one of these runs. So the quantity part was easy to, uh, to do. We, we developed a process here that we were processing at least two kilograms per run. So test run one, two, and three each had a minimum of two kilograms processed. Um, again, as you see, the processes are different. The roller compactor gave us uh, some higher readings than we did on the weighing and on the encapsulation. So when you look at the process, something like a milling process, which uh, fluidizes the material quite a bit, is more of a containment challenge. So we have to look at the process. And finally, we have to look at the product characteristics, and that's what we're seeing in this table that we're seeing extremely good results, but we've, we've got a granulated material. As we were handling product before in the dispense of uh, blending and roller compaction, we were handling a powder. So powder uh, is a finer material uh, versus the granulated form that goes into the encapsulator. So the process and the product characteristics have a lot to do with the overall performance. Lastly, we wanted to take a look at the bag in, bag out process that was used in all of these. So um, in the data tables, we did area monitoring around the transfer point because as we've said, transfer points are a critical aspect of the containment design. You have to get that right. So here internally, inside the isolator, a product was collected uh, in a product bag or container. In this case, we used a, a flexible product bag. And then that's moved into the bag out sleeve as shown in the picture on the left. That's moved into the sleeve so it's completely contained. We have a secure connection so that that connection uh, provides the containment. And then the really important thing is then this product is now inside a clean sleeve. So the operators can handle this through the facility. They can move it through the facility. They haven't had to clean it. So there's no risk of transferring product from, from this sleeve onto anything else. Uh, the picture on the right is the seal and separate process where uh, we use the crimping process, which is a secure closure, essentially gas tight, and requires a tool to remove the, uh, the, the, the crimp from the, um, from the process. So this, this assures that 
the bag out sleeve is not going to open and cause exposure at some point and and using the tool to open it that that allows you to access the material only when you want to access it. So moving on a little bit, uh, looking at uh, some, some challenges for CDMO type of operations, uh, which are referred to as shared facilities when we look at the regulatory norms, and, and, uh, and this landscape has is, is changed quite a bit now. Um, so uh, recently, regulatory requirements driven by the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, has required that uh, HPAPIs have a health-based exposure limit calculated, and they, they also then have to have an allowable daily exposure requirement calculated. Now, uh, again, the, there's a big change in how this is being required because the HBEL is really for the patient. So now uh, the EMA is recognizing that they're putting this in place in the manufacturing facility to protect the patient. The ADE is in place to protect the operators and the environment uh, within the manufacturing facilities. Um, so yeah, the, the world has changed quite a bit for um, shared facilities and CDMOs, CMOs. Uh, back in 2006, uh, we regularly were asked to provide containment systems that achieve less than one microgram per cubic meter. Uh, well, that's changed a lot now that the, uh, the majority of the URS that we, we receive uh, will have something less than 0.5 micrograms per cubic meter, and regularly we're addressing needs that are less than 0.1 microgram per cubic meter. Uh, down to 100 nanograms. So what's the future? We've already seen some customers requiring picogram levels of containment. And when you look at it, and particularly with the pass-fail test of the EN689 and the 10% of target, we're really starting to get to that picogram level of containment of a, as, as pass-fail. So uh, as time goes on, I'm sure we'll see even more changes to this, but um, now, with the HP APIs, it's, it's becoming uh, even more rigorous. So what does this uh, really mean in, 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 in uh, breaking this down into the guidance that we get? So, you know, starting in 2010, a uh, risk map from ISPE, uh, which was published in accordance with ICHQ-9, started to address how to manage cross-contamination in a shared facility. So this was interesting guidance because uh, it, was, it was a needed guidance from the standpoint that regulatory bodies were looking at having all HP API in segregated facilities, which would have been a significant additional cost for the manufacturing processes to locate all of the HP APIs in, in single facilities. Um, but in this uh, uh, risk map guide, uh, yeah, there was an identification of the four main sources of cross-contamination, and cross-contamination is, is product getting from one batch into another batch, and particularly it's, it's bad if, it, if there are different products. Product A gets into product B. So the four main sources identified were mix-up, retention, mechanical transfer, and airborne transfer. Well, mix-up is uh, something that a containment system really doesn't address. Uh, there, there, there could be a way to address it, uh, but mix-up is really that uh, the wrong material was brought in from the warehouse. So something that wasn't supposed to be in the process suite was brought into the process suite, opened up, and, and, and started to be used in the process. So mix-up was found to be the number one reason for cross-contamination. But the next three, and really focusing on the second uh, one, retention, were identified as uh, problems uh, for cross-contamination, and then the risk map process uh, provides a way to mitigate that. It's a database process where you collect data on what the real performance is. But retention as a definition is the residual material left on a surface after the cleaning has been uh, completed. As you'll see as we go on, that the value that we're offering for CDMO processes is all of the containment surfaces can be eliminated when using flexible containment, single-use containment, because instead of cleaning, we're going to dispose of, of those, uh, those surfaces, if you will. So again, to, re to reiterate, 
you know, using risk map, um, it's really understanding the risk of cross-contamination and where it comes from. So by applying that and using single-use technology and a contain at the source, uh, we can keep everything enclosed. Uh, we don't let anything escape into the environment. Uh, we can reduce the cleaning uh, that's required of a containment system and also the cleaning of a room. Um, if, uh, using the uh, data-based approach from risk map, uh, you can prove that the room is not contaminated to the levels that would require a cleaning. And, and that is a tremendous cost savings in, in not being able or not having to clean the room after a process. So the next uh, change in the regulatory landscape came in 2015 when the European Medicines Agency established the HB, HBEL for shared facilities. So um, this is a toxicolo toxicological approach. So no longer were cleaning limits established based on what cleaning could be, that toxicologists had to evaluate the products to understand, well, what the limits should be. And again, this is a, uh, an evaluation, an approach that is based on the patient. So again, in a shared facility, if product A is being made on Monday and product B is being made on Tuesday, that we can't find any of product A and product B. And looking at it from a patient standpoint, this means that we can't give a dose to a patient that's going to cause any type of reaction and so forth of a, of a drug that they, they, they didn't mean to take. So this, this has become a very strict rule, and it uh, is, is being addressed by um, industrial hygienists and so forth for applying containment systems. Now, to mimic that, uh, PICS, the Pharmaceutical Inspection Convention Scheme, uh, basically mimicked that in their 2018 guidance. Uh, they mimicked what EMA did to uh, adopt the HBEL and, and what needs to be done to have the proper controls. Now we'll go into, well, what are the real benefits? What are we talking about benefits that uh, CDMOs can get by, uh, by using flexible containment? Um, and in summary, there really are a, a tremendous reduction in capital expenditure to achieve high containment. As facilities are looking in to bring in uh, these HPAPI compounds, the investment into capital uh, containment equipment could be massive with respect to isolators, uh, bin systems, split butterfly valve systems, and so forth. And so flexible containment offers a, uh, a methodology to meet the containment levels required uh, and have a, a greatly reduced capital expenditure, typically reducing capital by up to 80-85%. We're also going to reduce or eliminate the cleaning processes as we talked about containing at the source. Uh, we're going to eliminate cleaning and validating of the containment system surfaces and possibly even uh, eliminate or reduce the cleaning of the um, of the actual process suite as well. So here's the elimination of retention. So big point here is that elimination elimination of retention in risk map. Uh, it's detailed that there is no such thing as perfectly clean. There always will be retention, and no matter what you do for cleaning, will always leave some residue or retention. And and this is an interesting thing that develops over time. Everyone has received brand new pharmaceutical equipment with a nice uh, surface on it, nice polish, and then and then as that changes uh, uh, with cleaning and use and so forth, uh, it becomes a challenge to um, to maintain that surface uh, finish. And and this is where uh, residue can fit into the scratches and so forth of the surface. Also, a benefit that CDMOs have realized is the cost control of knowing the specific cost of consumables used with flexible containment, single-use containment, because that becomes a fixed cost that they can identify on and they can understand, versus the cleaning process, which can be a little bit random. And if for some reason the cleaning isn't done correctly um, and, and validation of that cleaning can't be done, then cleaning has to be repeated. So, so again, there's a lot of inefficient cleaning that goes on and so being able to know what your containment costs are going to be versus uh, a variable cleaning cost and so forth helps out 
with the whole uh, cost model. So looking at a couple of different applications for the benefits of reduced capital expenditure, we're going to look at uh, two products that do the same exact thing. Uh, the product on the left is, uh, is an IBC, a stainless steel IBC, and the product on the right is an FIBC, a flexible intermediate bulk container, which is the Dover Pack product. So looking at what the capital expenditure could be when uh, looking at, at installing one of these technologies, uh, the flow chart on the top is for uh, the IBC technology. So um, we've got to go out and buy the IBC. So these are the stainless steel bins. But with that, to be able to achieve containment, and in this example, we're saying that the containment level would be uh, less than one microgram per cubic meter. So you do have to go buy high containment split butterfly valves to be used with these bins. Um, so that's quite an expense. Uh, but now these bins with the split butterfly valve have to be used with a uh, precision lifting and positioning device. Um, so this gets to be quite expensive as well to install that, to purchase and install that. If, if a precision, precision device is not used, there's a lot of risk of damaging the split butterfly valves, which again, just go into more and more cost. And then there's the cleaning of the bins. So we're going to reuse the bins, so we need to clean them. So buying a washing machine, a tunnel, or a CIP system, you've got drying that goes into it. So that's a really big cost. It's a big cost not only to acquire that in capital expenditure, but it's always a fairly big uh, footprint that, that uh, takes up space in the manufacturing area. So, so that's always a big thing as well. Um, and then there is a intangible cost about having to store these IVCs and these split butterfly valves. They just can't go out into the lot outside. They have to be stored somewhere within uh, the plant environment and so forth, taking up space. So we look at the same exact uh, process, but using the Dover Pack, the FIBC. And here, uh, the CapEx starts with uh, a docking device. So. Um, these are high containment systems that require a stainless steel docking device, uh, can be referred to as the O-ring canister system. Uh, but these docking devices are simple uh, docking devices that are mounted with a tri-clamp or, or a bolt pattern. Um, and so in a, uh, in a CapEx, you need one to discharge from a process into a Dover pack and another one to charge into a process out of the Dover pack. And so you'd expect a total CapEx there of about $40,000. Again, we're referring to equipment in both examples that would be uh, stainless steel, 316 stainless steel. Uh, obviously, if Hasteloy was needed, that would be a great greater expense. So next, uh, docking of the, uh, the Dover pack. This is not a precision docking system. If we can get it within a couple of inches of where we're going into the process, then that's good. So a much lower cost, a simple uh, GMP hoisting system can be used. So we estimated that at about $50,000. And then lastly, we have the consumable for the, um, uh, for the FIBC. And, and so a high containment Dover pack in roughly the 400 liter size cost in, in the area of $600. So we went through this analysis and said, well, for the cost of capital here, the, the uh, the, the capital expense that ha would have to be put out, and looking at a process that would um, have six batches in, um, uh, per year, or let's say in year one, and uh, this would require five IBCs or five uh, Dover packs for each batch, uh, you can see the, the great difference between the 650,000 CapEx and the 108,000 CapEx for the Dover Pack system. So a, a huge cost savings when it comes to the um, using the FIBC, uh, just a, a, a huge cost savings on the capital side. So we'll look at the same example using isolator technology. So the example on the left and the example on the right uh, are for the exact same process. Um, performance was at one microgram per cubic meter. The process performed inside was a co-milling operation with some weighing and sampling. Uh, so you can see the, the hard wall isolator on, on the left is a very expensive device with a capex of, of $775,000, where the static isolator on the right that achieved less than one microgram per cubic meter is only $55,000 in a capital expenditure. 
So, you know, dramatic difference. Now, again, we could look at the at the flexible isolator and say, yeah, but uh, that's a static system. Uh, our hard wall isolator is a negative pressure system. Well, it's possible then to add an automated negative pressure control uh, to that flexible isolator. So in this case, we're showing the jet vent and uh, completely automated system, exactly how hard wall isolators work, in which we have a variable speed fan and a pressure control system set up so that we can monitor fluctuations in the internal pressure, maintaining a negative pressure, and also preparing to go at a very fast speed, the fan going at a very fast speed, uh, if we identify some upset condition, a glove failure or something like that. So here, even if we added this to our example of the CapEx, it's, uh, it's a $60,000 estimated uh, uh, value. So we still have the difference of a hard wall isolator um, at an extreme $775,000 cost and a, um, a negative pressure flexible isolator at less than $125,000 cost. So the second thing we'll look at is the benefit of, of uh, reduced cleaning. We'll look at the same examples again. So, uh, you know, when we look at cleaning of an IBC, uh, we, we've got some problems to start off with because we don't know what's left inside the, the IBC. There's always going to be retained powder in there, particularly if we have a poor flowing powder, maybe some stickiness and so forth. So the regular practice in the pharmaceutical market is that the first rin rinse of, of the IBC is captured because it has a rich content of whatever that HPAPI might have been. So that's typically captured and then gone off for disposal, which is typically an incineration. So there's time and cost just to get that first rinse done. And then we've got a detergent rinse, and then we've got uh, a clean water rinse, uh, WFI rinse, if you will, and then drying. And then we're only partway there. Now we have to disassemble the containment valve. Assuming this is going to be a high containment split butterfly valve, there could be some additional cleaning on the seals there as well as maintenance, and then we have to go off and store it. Now we look at the FIBC and the Dover Pack, a very straightforward system, and starting with that idea of what's left inside, well, you always know with a flexible intermediate bulk container that you've discharged everything out. You can see and or feel to make sure that there's not a blockage that left a couple of kilos inside or anything like that. Also as a benefit, uh, operators will typically, as their last operation, physically shake the FIBC and release any retained powder on the walls of the, uh, of, of the FIBC. So, so literally we're getting everything but uh, maybe 50 grams, 100 grams out. So it's, uh, we, we haven't lost any product during this process, which oftentimes is the case with a stainless steel IBC. Um, so after we, 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 we have all the product out of the Dover pack, then we want to evacuate the gas because we're going to do a seal and separate on it. And this seal and separate using the crimping process is basically a gas type um, process. So we don't want to uh, make a balloon. So we're going to evacuate the gas. Uh, we've got the seal and separate. And now we just uh, place that into a drum for disposal and, and off it goes. So it's a very simplistic, low cost kind of process compared to the cost of uh, cleaning an FIBC. Um, so here we've got our, our second and last polling question we want to run by you, so I'll hand it back to uh, Jared. Thank you very much. So that question is, does your company track the cost associated with cleaning, including labor, cleaning materials, disposal of materials, and validation? The answers are no. Cleaning is performed as required and the costs are not tracked. No, we have an SOP and we can estimate the costs. Yes, we have an SOP and we follow the actual costs. Yes, this cost is part of our manufacturing costs. While you answer, Scott, what results are you expecting? Right, our experience is that uh, the cleaning process, whether that's of the equipment and or a process suite, is just considered to be part of the manufacturing cost and, and its cost of doing business, if you will, in the pharmaceutical industry. So. It's been very hard for us to obtain specific numbers on cleaning costs. So uh, we, we, we think companies understand it, but we're not sure that they actually collect those costs and track it. Thank you very much. We now move to the results. So 
With number one, we have 27.3%. Number two is 18.2%. And number four is 54.5%. What do you make of these results? Well, that's uh, that, that's fascinating. So our um, our 54.5%, uh, yes, this cost is part of our manufacturing costs. Uh, um, that, that's very good. So customers would understand uh, what the cost of cleaning are specifically, you know, as, as uh, they track these costs. Wonderful. When you're ready, please continue. So to finish up our uh, evaluation of uh, the benefits of, of reduced cleaning, we, we look at the isolator example again. So here uh, we're looking at that same hard wall isolator. Uh, the containment surfaces, so not the surfaces of the, uh, of the mill inside or, or any equipment inside, but just the containment surfaces is roughly 20,000 square inches. Um, so this has to be cleaned through possibly CIP, but also there will be some manual cleaning required. So you've got a lot of time and labor involved here. Uh, glove surfaces are not included in, um, in the 20,000 uh, square inch estimate. Um, these, are, um, uh, these surfaces uh, you know, are critical because they're actually in contact often with the, uh, the product. And we, we know from discussion with customers that gloves tend, gloves tend to be a, a failure point uh, because they're used over and over and over again in these hard wall systems. Again, we know that uh, there are maintenance plans to replace gloves, but we often see that the failure of a glove is due to fatiguing and so forth from all of these uh, cleanings that go on. Ergonomics is, is always an issue in, in the manual cleaning and something like this, trying to clean the, 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 the roof, if you will, the top surface of the isolator, very difficult. Even reaching to the back of the isolator can be difficult ergonomically. And just the point here that uh, um, you know, the work was done to go with a hard wall isolator with a pass box, as you can see on the right. But on the left, uh, the customer chose to go with the continuous liner technology or flexible containment. And as we said before, the critical point of containment is, is always at the transfer point. So here the, the customer had confidence to use a continuous liner despite the uh, high capital expense of the uh, hard wall isolator. So the, uh, the, the example that doing the same job is the flexible isolator. So here we have a six-sided isolator. We often call it a balloon. And, um, and so in this, uh, this system, we can dispose of 100% of the containment surface. So that 20,000 square inches, isn't, uh, it doesn't need to be clean. Dramatic savings here. Uh, we do recommend a specific wet-in-place process uh, for the surfaces before we're going to prepare for removal and disposal. And we do suggest a standard operating practice for the removal. So in this case, we're showing a six-sided isolator. Often we're working with five-sided isolators where it, it's not going to have a bottom. And so by following these SOPs, we've been finding that the overall exposure to the operators and to the environment still is absolutely minimized uh, even when removing something that has an open surface on it. But it requires a wet in place process and an SOP for removal. Again, we use the bag out uh, system here versus the pass box used on the, on the hard wall system, which again facilitates the removal of product very easily um, that's contained and safe to handle. And really uh, one of the, the tremendous benefits that are recognized from flexible containment in when we're using isolators uh, is when any cleaning is needed. And so in this case, uh, the comb mill, which is on the back wall, uh, the comb mill would need to be cleaned and, and the flexible containment moves with the operator. Uh, the isolator is actually connected to this frame using bungee cords. So it, uh, it allows the operator to move quite easily, uh, perhaps disassemble and do cleaning on the um, on, on the comb mill parts and, and so forth. So uh, ergonomics are always a big benefit for flexible containment. So in summary, you know, taking a look at uh, what we've presented today, uh, flexible containment, single use products have been used uh, in uh, the pharma industry and now for HP API for over 20 years. The data from independent containment assessments as we showed one have, are showing containment performance in many cases of less than 10 nanograms per cubic meter. So these are very definite uh, containment assessments uh, giving very good results. 
uh, regulatory guidelines are, are changing and uh, impacting the cleaning re requirements and the tox methods uh, that will be used. And, and in uh, CDMO facilities, this is becoming a more critical aspect of how to do the business and handling HP APIs and how to protect the operators and how to protect the environment. And lastly, the capital expense and operator, uh, operating costs. So your CapEx and your OpEx are, are both reduced uh, by using flexible containment systems, uh, particularly on the operating costs, reduce the cleaning, reduce the risk of cross-contamination. Uh, this, this is part of the whole risk mitigation process uh, shown by RiskMap. Uh, reduce that, and, uh, and it's a better uh, value proposition. So, Jared, uh, we've come to uh, the end of the presentation, and uh, if we have any questions, we can take those now. Wonderful. Thank you very much. As you said, we can now submit questions, so please just type them into the box, the top left-hand corner of your screen, and click Submit. But I have a few already here for you, and that first one is, is a flexible containment system at risk for a failure like a tear or puncture? Right, Jared. That's uh, that's the common question as as customers look to use flexible containment for the the first time, um, and and you know our answer to that is from an ILC Dover perspective that uh, we use uh, the actual flexible part, the film part. We use a particular film that's built for high strength and puncture resistance, the Armor Flex film has been developed specifically for the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical market to not only meet the regulatory requirements, but also these physical requirements. And so in our experience and from customer surveys, uh, there have been uh, literally uh, no reports of these, these type of failures. Now, we've heard from customers about FIBCs and what if I run a forklift into my F FIBC, aren't I, aren't I going to puncture it? Well, of course, you're probably going to do that, but, but if, you, if you're going to puncture the FIBC and you do the same thing to an IBC, uh, you could also puncture that. You could damage a stainless steel IBC quite, uh, quite definitely, and, and I think the, um, the, the cost and the risks are even more there. So it, it's possible, but uh, again, we've developed a system to assure the maximum strength to minimize any risk of failure. Thank you very much. I have another question here for you. Are single-use products considered a green solution, and can they be recycled? Right. Okay. So um, that, that almost sounds like it's coming from the biopharmaceutical market, which has adopted uh, so much of the single-use technology. There's a, a mass of, of these single-use products out there. Um, so as we look in the pharmaceutical market, um, there's a couple of things. Uh, uh, there can't be recycling of the products that we provide. Um, they've been exposed to these uh, toxic uh, pharmaceutical compounds. And so um, the, the choice of, of how to handle these are disposal and usually incineration. Uh, but we would look at that and compare that to the cleaning processes that go on with, uh, with the hard wall solutions. And in, in so many cases, we, we know that the cleaning solutions are, are taking large amounts of water. There's a lot of energy put into the water from because uh, it, just, it just isn't tap water. It's WFI typically. Um, and then in some cases, that's collected and incinerated. And, um, you know, in the example of the IBC versus the FIBC, the FIBC is using no water. Uh, the IBC is using a significant amount of water with that first uh, perhaps couple of hundred liters having to go to um, incineration. So uh, what is more green, um, the incineration of two or three kilos of a polyethylene plastic film or uh, having to incinerate water. Um, and, you know, as we look at the global markets, there are a lot of areas where, you know, water is starting to be a premium. And so we would suggest that uh, uh, a high use of water that can't be uh, filtered and returned into the environment um, is, is not a real green solution either. Thank you very much. Just a reminder, you can still ask questions using the top left-hand corner box. I have another one here for you, though. Slide 23 quoted $55,000 for the flexible isolator. Does this include cost for the frame? 
Yes, yes. So that was uh, the fifty-five thousand dollars was a turnkey cost for the frame. Um, you saw the bag in bag out system, and, and actually in this system on the um, on the back side was a superstructure of the frame to hold the um, the quadro comb mill. So yeah, that was an all in cost on the fifty-five thousand, and typically uh, it will also include two. Uh, consumables for the flexible isolator, but but yeah, that's an all-in cost. Thank you very much. Another one here for you. Do the product contact materials meet the regulatory compliance norms? Right. This is uh, you know one of the critical aspects in using single-use products, and and in the pharmaceutical industry, it's it's critical. In the biopharmaceutical industry, I'd even say it's it's more critical. So uh, right, the, the minimum level needed uh, to use a uh, single-use flexible containment product would be, you know, the FDA compliance and then also compliance to uh, the European Food Safety Authority and, and their food contact uh, requirements. There's, there's other global requirements as well, and that's sort of the minimum. And then we step up, and now we have standards for uh, the U.S. Pharmacopeia, the Europe Pharmacopeia, um, so we have to address those. Um, again, Japan has some standards to meet as well. Um, so, and, and then once we get beyond that, we get into more specific standards of uh, no heavy metals, uh, no animal-derived materials, and, and so forth. So as we put these all together, um, the regulatory landscape re requires a very uh, highly characterized film uh, which has to be proven through these tests and through extractable and leachables. So, um, you know, yes, there there is a high standard that's required for these films. Thank you very much. I have another one here for you. Can we use the flexible isolator and the canopy set for multiple times? But the whole set would be dedicated to one product. So we, we, we have had that experience, yes. Yeah. So we uh, this goes to some of the opening comments about robustness. So the example that I will give is that uh, uh, we provided a isolator system to a company that was making an oral contraceptive. So uh, the system was being dedicated to that. Now the, the isolator system was being used for analytics of tablets coming off the tablet press. Um, so as they would take samples every 15 minutes, they'd transfer them into the flexible isolator. Um, you know, we knew their production levels were high and following up with a customer uh, uh, initially six months after we did the installation and they hadn't asked for any additional consumables, a replacement flexible isolator. In that case, uh, because they were disposing of the tablets afterwards, because they were testing them for thickness, hardness, weight, and so forth, uh, the tablets were scrapped. And, and so if you do have a dedicated product, um, it is possible to use these over and over and over again. Um, it's, a, it's a, again, not a matter of robustness. It's a matter of cleaning. So we, we would suggest in, for this question to go back and look at whatever the, the quality department requires from a cleaning protocol. And as long as it's on the same product, if cleaning isn't required, then you know, we would fully suggest to uh, to continue to use the flexible isolator system. Thank you very much. I have one final question here for you. Can a flexible isolator be removed and disposed of and maintain containment? Right. So um, we've been studying this now through our containment assessments, and uh, and we found uh, through the containment assessments that. Um, the containment performance target is somewhat missed during the, the cleaning and removal process, but also um, we found that the cleaning protocols weren't really being followed quite well. In, in one case, uh, it was clear that uh, there was visible powder uh, on equipment uh, inside the isolator. So when the isolator was removed, uh, again, there was some amount of exposure or excursion of the containment level. So, so again, cleaning is, is part of the whole process, and that's why we say an SOP has to be developed to be able to minimize that. Um, the second round of, of that test was really interesting. After we had done the containment assessment, we had gone back to do some additional training with, with the company, 
and um, they had decided to uh, sort of show the operators uh, what they were missing. So uh, the surrogate that we used in the training process had a fluorescing powder mixed in, a glow germ. And so then after the process was done and the cleaning process started before the removal of the isolator, uh, we went in with a black light, and, and or a UV light, I'm sorry, and we were able to show uh, the, the operators where they had missed uh, powder. So it, it can be done. Uh, we've also seen a study done in Japan where they went as far as not only the swab surfaces inside the isolator, but they swabbed the floor of the, oper of, of the process suite. So it can be done, but it requires a proper um, SOP. Thank you very much, everyone, for your questions. However, if your question was not answered, do not worry, as the team will be in contact with you with any answers to your queries. That just leaves me to thank you, Scott, for what was a great webinar, and to ILC Dover for sponsoring this session. To the attendees, you will receive an email shortly telling you how you can access the on-demand version of this webinar, or you can access it through our website, which is business-review-webinars.com. We look forward to sharing further webinars with you, so please do keep an eye out on the website just mentioned, and follow us on Twitter at BR Webinars for daily updates, and join our LinkedIn group, Business Review Webinars. Thank you once again, and I hope you all have a lovely day.